Lingua Britannica is a podcast that uses ethnographic interviews to study language use in the extreme metal community. We are studying a music scene known for its love of themes and topics generally considered offensive, and it is likely that some episodes will touch on topics or opinions some listeners may find tasteless or ethically problematic. Ethnographic researchers aim to adopt the interviewee's point of view so that we can draw out and study the attitudes, beliefs, and practices that are important to them. We want to make it clear that in presenting these conversations here, we do not endorse any of their content. Our aim is to explore thought processes behind language use in this long-running international and yet understudied scene. everyone, you're listening to Lingua Britannica, hosted by me, Jess Benny smith and my co-host, Wes Robertson. Hello. Uh, on today's episode, we're talking to Malika, uh, who is the vocalist in several bands, uh, including Abnormality, uh, or at least you know, was the vocalist of Abnormality, uh, Nidoros, and uh, of course, Castrator. So we'll be talking about uh, Malika's uh, work with Castrator today. Um, and at this point, I'd usually introduce where Castrator is from, but I realize that's a little bit more complicated because although Castrator is based in the US, right, the band is somewhat transnational, yeah? Yes, yes, international. Um, our members are located in different places and we also are moving. <laughs> so actually, we, <laughs> we say that we're centered in New York City because that's where we've played the most shows and our drummer was living in New York City, but she since has moved um to Ohio so so now yeah now we're just international yeah Prague Florida and Ohio um so yeah so very international (laughs) then yeah (laughs) yeah and we also had a member that was in Norway and from Mexico but she's not with the band anymore right yeah so interesting combination (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah um so for people that have never heard of uh, Castrator's music before, how would you describe it? It's death metal, or you could say brutal death metal. Um, a little bit uh, of old school death metal influences. Cool. And um, I noticed on um, a couple of your uh, social media pages, you actually described the band's music as emasculating death metal. Uh, can you explain <laughs> to us what that means to you? Yeah, being all women, but we don't really want to center on our gen- on our gender, but it's definitely music from a female perspective, especially lyrically. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so and it can be intimidating for some guys. So <laughs> just put it right out there, <laughs> emasculating death metal. <laughs> and yeah. it, you know, it, it's catchy. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely gets attention. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So when did you first personally start listening to uh, metal music and what attracted you to the style at first? Well, it was a progression. I, you know, when I was a kid, I was, I liked rock music and getting into like classic rock and then like heavy like hard rock and then trying different kinds of metal, like more mainstream metal at first. And yeah, I was attracted to the extreme sound and um, the aggression, the energy of it appealed to me, especially as a teenager, Mm -hmm. Uh, an angsty teenager, it it spoke to me. (laughs) (laughs) How'd you move from, uh, I guess what you would call mainstream metal into kind of the brutal death metal area? How, how did I? Yeah, like what, what was sort of the, um, the jumping point from moving from what you call mainstream metal or hard rock into the kind of brutal death metal that uh, Cash Shredder plays? I think, um, well, it, like I said, it was a progression. It wasn't just one thing, but um, I had a friend in high school that had a death metal band, and he introduced me to a number of bands, including Cannibal Corpse and um, morbid angel deicide and that was like the first taste and went on from there and so I was exposed to his his band and then also discovering the the Massachusetts metal scene and and other um, death metal bands from there especially in college that's when I really delved deep into the death metal scene Mm -hmm. but I I never like limited myself by genre like I also listened to different kinds of things like 
during college and, and since then, yeah. So it's not death metal all the time, but that's where I really found my passion, at least like what I wanted to do. Um, I felt like it was a great form of expression doing those kinds of extreme vocals. So yeah, that's where my real passion was with music, but I enjoy listening to a lot of different genres too. And did you ever like pay attention to the lyrics when you were first getting into death metal or, um, you know, has that just, I suppose, like come along a bit later? Yeah, I think it, yeah, I always was checking out like the lyrics, especially, yeah, with CD, when CDs were the main uh, format (laughs) when I was (laughs) first listening to music, the, you know, reading the booklets with the lyrics right there. Nowadays, like, you know, you might listen to a band first, like digitally, and then like, you have to find their lyrics that way. But yeah, I think it definitely like the extreme lyrics stood out too. And like, as a way of expressing emotions, and anger, um, that was a big part of it. But the unique thing about brutal death metal, or like the most extreme kinds of of vocals, you don't always hear the words. So it's, Mm. you have to really like, read the booklet or find the lyrics to know what this and some some fans just like don't really bother like it's like a a choice like if you want to know what they're saying you can just enjoy it for the sound for the feeling you get from the music yeah it's like with death metal it's it's like optional if you want to know the (laughs) lyrics (laughs) unlike other kinds of music you hear Mm. the words more so it's kind of funny and there are some bands i like like cryptopsy where you have the lyrics and you're listening to lord worm and he's not saying (laughs) what is in the lyrics (laughs) like he's just making stuff up you can hear like a few words here and there but you you know like as a vocals especially i know that he's not really singing that so it's kind of funny it's like hear the lyrics (laughs) it's not really in the song (laughs) (laughs) so there are bands like that but myself i i do enunciate the words that are the lyrics um Mm. with abnormality and with castrator with Mm -hmm. neaterus it's a little bit more (laughs) loosey-goosey more more uh actually like on the demo there aren't any lyrics (laughs) uh, yeah and we're still deciding if we want there to be lyrics on the upcoming full length but it's going to be more of the lord worm approach where maybe I won't be saying every word, but I'll have some lyrics probably. (laughs) The vocals are almost like an instrumental kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. The voice becomes an instrument. Exactly. Yeah. It's an interesting comment that we've heard quite a few times, like comparing um, like death metal vocals to like a percussive instrument. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah, it really can be. Um, So, but I think that gives you the freedom to really experiment. It's a choice, you know, how clear you want to be heard or if you want people to, you know, imagine what you're saying, or if you want it to really be clear in what you're saying, it's a choice. Mm. So I have, I have fun with that. Sometimes I, I want to be like very clear. And sometimes I just want to make crazy animal noises. <laughs> <laughs> so what drives the decision to do one or the other? Um, probably some song topic and which band it is. Like with Neaters, it's just the most kind of brutal music you can make and it's more about the sound and creating this really putrid atmosphere Mm. um leaving more to the imagination we're setting Mm. setting a scene and the you know lyrics aren't that important in it Mm -hmm. you mentioned when you were younger um some of the things that attracted you to the scene were kind of the heaviness and the uh, the anger and stuff uh, and the angsty teen kind of thing that you mentioned. Is uh, is do you feel differently about metal now that you've gotten older and been involved in like making metal music, or has the things you like about it and things that draw you to it still kind of stayed the same over time? Well, I def- yeah, I mean the way I am now versus when I was a teenager, I've, I've evolved a lot, and um, my what I like about music has changed. You know, I appreciate more. Um, the complexities and and like good lyrics now I, I do appreciate it more and more simple kinds of angry lyrics isn't enough for me maybe like a uh, kind of like more juvenile or simple kind of lyrics wouldn't satisfy me now versus like being a teenager or something like I can sure. see 
a more sophisticated approach to lyric writing um, that just comes with age and experience. But there's a place for everything, you know, and yeah, I do appreciate bands that take different approaches or more, more unique approaches to, to lyrics. Um, and as a lyric writer, like with, with Castrator and Abnormality, I, I, you know, I do put an effort on, on writing interesting topics or interesting lyrics in general. So, so yeah, about Neaters, it's like night and day different from Abnormality <laughs> and Castrator. <laughs> Currently, are there any lyrics that stand out to you as being, um, I mean, from, from bands other than your own, as like your favorite or lyrics that you're really enjoying or engaging with? Do you have like a favorite metal lyric or, or song? I should have thought about this ahead of time because I knew this question was coming, but <laughs> I have, I have you know, uh, favorite bands like Suffocation, Immolation, um, Morbid Angel. They, they have this like well-written lyrics and with a really like dark atmosphere. Um, that's what I really enjoy. And bands like Origin, because they're unique, mm. they're writing about outer space and like kind of like a Lovecraftian approach. Um, Nile also, Nile is an interesting one because they're writing about ancient Egypt. And I like this kind of approach with like, with Nile and Origin, like, where if you think about the great expanse of the universe or the expanse of time, how significant is each individual human life? Like you, you seem really like unimportant in the grand history and the grand expanses of the cosmos. So I like those kind of that atmosphere and those feelings that they get at with their lyrics. That's interesting because like the lyrics that you've mentioned, I suppose, are quite mm -hmm. atypical, would you say, of like, you know, metal lyrics yeah. in general? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there is a lot of bands like that because, you know, mm. to write something new or, you know, to, to get at new territory in a genre that's, you know, now 30 years old, you have to get in, you know, you have to think outside the box or mm. it's, a, or you're, just writing the same so kind of songs over and over again and, and to, to stay interesting and fresh. Yeah, you, you do have to think outside the box. Yeah, I mean, given that you have that to do that, like, does that mean then, like, I suppose, I'm wondering, like, given the kind of variation that we're seeing then in, um, you know, the lyrical content um, of metal songs, like, does that mean that, like, what defines metal and not metal is becoming, you know, more difficult to distinguish? Lyrically or musically? I think musically. I'd say lyrically. Lyrically, yeah. Yeah, yeah I think musically maybe it's a bit more clear, but. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think that's the thing. Yeah, lyrically, maybe you wouldn't. Yeah, the lines are more blurred. Yeah, you know, but musically, you can hear right away what is metal, yeah. what is death metal. Yeah, but I think that's exciting. Um, the new kinds, the new bands that, that are coming out with new ideas. Because, yeah, nobody wants to hear like the same kinds of topics over and over again. So, um, and I think in other genres too, like we're exploring new ideas, we're entering such like unique times um, with technology and the state of the world. There's plenty of material to work with to create something mm. fresh, you know? And so, you know, people that create art, music or, or visual art, um, we all are connected. We're all similar. We're all living through these times. Mm. So, so you may discover more similarities than you might think with a death metal musician or a pop artist. <laughs> mm. Is there anything kind of unifying with different, uh, I suppose, metal artists? Like, uh, you know, despite all these differences that we've just discussed, is there anything that kind of, I suppose, unifies uh, the kind of lyrical content of metal that, you know, does still make it, uh, I suppose, recognizably metal? Like if you were to right. read a random set of lyrics, do you think you could have a uh, guess whether or not it's metal band at a better than 50% rate? Uh, yeah, I think, um, so you're asking what makes what makes it uniquely metal. I think the extremes often uh, metal musicians are attracted to extremes and, and the lyrics are no exception. Um, and the way we uh, write lyrics, like the structure of the sentences may be a bit different. Mm. Um, we might be 
arranging the words in a more kind of like old English way or like kind of more like poetic way than, than another genre, I think. Um, it's kind of difficult to explain without mm. showing you lyrics or something. But I, can... yeah, I think I get the idea um, though, yeah. like, cause that means that then you can like, kind of treat all of these different ideas and themes, but through like yeah. a very recognizably metal lens. Yes, yes. Right? Yeah. And I think, yeah, I think you would, if you just saw the written word, I think you could pick apart the majority of, of metal songs by the lyrics alone. Um, there is kind of like a style. Um, yeah, I could, I could read you some excerpts from <laughs> some, <laughs> some lyrics if you want, but yeah. <laughs> we should definitely do that at some point though. I think somebody suggested yeah. several times, I think uh, that we have a segment like that, <laughs> reading out metal yeah. lyrics and trying to guess yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, if we can work out uh, you know, what subgenre they fit into or you know, just reading a whole bunch of random lyrics and figuring out if they're metal or not. Metal or not yeah. <laughs> that, yeah. that actually would be a fun quiz. Is it metal or show? not? And yeah, yeah, game show. I could see this happening. <laughs> yeah, maybe we should integrate it into the next interview or something. That'd be good. <laughs> Is it metal or uh, metal or old literature? Something like that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah actually, yeah. <laughs> That would be good, yeah. Yeah. There's a band. Uh, I remember this band that just took Finnegan's Wake as is and put it in a song. <laughs> so I guess like compared to all the stuff that uh, you know you recognize and you do enjoy from metal and the metal scene and metal lyrics, are there things mm -hmm. that you find commonly within the lyrics of the scene that you don't enjoy or that you try to personally avoid when you write lyrics? Yeah, I mean, generic misogynistic lyrics. I don't really appreciate. I get. I mean, I understand it's a part of death metal history and was originally like just meant to be shocking or something but I, f I find it like old and boring and as a woman I don't really like to see it everywhere like <laughs> and it's usually just like not it's not creative like to just write rehash old cannibal chords mm -hmm. lyrics or something but you do see like especially young bands a lot of them still doing that but it, I think it's going out of fashion mm -hmm. in death mm -hmm. metal to write just generic misogynistic lyrics i hope so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I've, I've had this conversation with some other uh, journalists before yeah and i mean like i'm not really like offended by it i just think it's like i get where they're coming from but i, I just think it's unoriginal and it's not shocking anymore but i think it's worse it's worse when a band really means it like mm. Of course, and yeah. I think there are, uh, having met hundreds of, or thousands of bands, like I think some of the guys really do have misogynistic ideas. It's the mi minority though. Most of the guys that write lyrics like that about rape or whatever, I think um, they're just trying to be funny or shocking, but I, I, it's neither <laughs> anymore, <laughs> anymore, at least maybe in the nineties, it was original, mm -hmm. but it's not 30 years later. <laughs> and, <laughs> I'm I'm glad to see that it's it's going away. Yeah. Do you think uh, even some of the old bands are kind of changing? Like, do you think Cannibal Corpse is changing their style a bit, or do they? Yeah, still... I, th I think they are. Like, I mean, they're staying true to themselves, but I think mm -hmm. I think they're they're not. I think they're not as misogynistic as they were. I think they're writing writing more about killing in general, um, <laughs> but the. I don't know. Yeah, I haven't really talked to them about it. <laughs> but de devourment, uh, you know, devourment. Um, they're like, you know, known as being originally one of the more misogynistic bands in brutal death metal, and, and they've come out on the record to say that they they don't they're not into writing lyrics like that anymore, and they don't, they also don't really think it's original or any or shocking anymore. Mm. So yeah bands that formerly were writing lyrics like that aren't doing it anymore and don't really think it's cool either so you can find I can send you an article about that <laughs> after this <laughs> yeah that'd be cool yeah would like to read it yeah yeah so besides that um lyrics lyrics that I don't like it would just be like poorly written lyrics like without much effort mm. which you can find sometimes but usually those bands don't really make it far without having mm. quality lyrics it's more like a, a young band kind of thing you know if, if a band is not a native english speaking band like i can forgive 
you know, poorly, <laughs> poorly written English lyrics a little bit more. <laughs> but it, yeah. When did you personally start writing uh, like extreme metal lyrics? Just when I started playing in bands. It was almost 20 years ago. Before that, I wrote poetry sometimes, you know. Okay. Mm. School, and I've always been a visual artist also. Um, mm -hmm. And to me, creating a piece of art or music is, is similar in my mind. You know, getting out an, an idea or a feeling from, from my art or music is, is the same, you know, part of the brain. So what's the actual process like? of writing a song yeah like the lyrics at least yeah okay um usually for for myself i'll come up with the concept first like what i want the song to be about and maybe some of the music is already written like maybe the band has already started working on the guitar riffs and maybe i'll get you know the feeling from the song i'm like oh this one will be perfect for I always wanted to write a song about blah, 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 you know, and, mm. and I think this song will be great for it. Mm. Um, so I'll have an idea, a gen really vague general idea, what I want the song to be about. Um, and then I, I have like a, note, a lyric notebook always. And so I'll just, you know, just jot down rough ideas about the song. And then mm. I'll sit down and either listen to the music and think about the patterns or I'll just write out lyrics like in a kind of poem form and then later I'll adjust it to the song so there's like slight variations depends sometimes the song will be completely written musically and I'll do the lyrics and sometimes I have lyrics all written out and I just put it on the song after do you edit while you write? Like, have you ever, do you cut words because they're not, they don't fit the song or like, do you, have you ever like deleted words because they don't feel metal or? Um, yeah, like, like, especially when I've already written the lyrics and if, uh, if I have too many lyrics, then yeah, I'll have to drop some parts of, parts of it to fit the song. Mm. But usually what happens is I put it to the song and there's still some gaps. So then mm. I write extra lyrics. That's usually what happens. Um, so um, yeah, and dropping things cause they don't seem metal enough. I mean, sure. It's like, it's all like a work in progress up until I finalize it. So I have the song and then I'm looking at it over and over again, like, okay, this word can be better. Mm -hmm. So I'll, you know, take out the thesaurus and, mm -hmm. and rework, rework the, the word so that it fits um, with the syllables and that it sounds good. It sounds metal enough or like dark <laughs> enough. It has to suit, first it has to suit the theme of the song mostly because some, some of my songs can be like really, really dark, serious subject matter, no humor, right? And then some of them are a bit more humorous. So I might use a different kind of different kinds of words depending on the song if it's a really serious song I, I don't want it to sound funny you know hmm. yeah so like I mean when you adjust the words and like you know decide um, that you know this word works better than this word or this word sounds like it's going to you know suit you know the genre a little bit more um, how do you make that decision uh, just reading it and taking a break revisiting it and seeing if I feel the same way singing the song with the lyrics and if I'm like oh this is like too many syllables in this phrase it's really hard to to say it all like I'll simplify it or often it's pretty easy for me as an experienced vocalist actually I can just kind of like figure out how to smush the syllables together or like drop an ah uh, or the you know like mm. like um uh, <laughs> it's hard to say without an example, but you know, the the connecting words you don't have to pronounce them as much, you know, and it's still understandable in the in this context. Um, so I don't often have to drop words just because of the the music. I can just not pronounce as much certain parts of words or small words and still get it get it across. Um, but 
uh, will usually adjust it just for style style purposes, stylistically um, wanting to improve it. Do you have a like an audience in mind when you write, or do you not think about the the audience at all? Um, I try not to. I just try to write the music that I would like. Um, mm. Because if you think too much about are they going to love it, are they going to hate it, then it's really hard to put something out there. Mm. But if if I'm satisfied with it, then I'm ready to put it out in the world and someone can love it or not love it. And that's okay. I mean, do you ever think about that on like a larger scale, I suppose? Like, you know, obviously, as you know, like in mainstream media, metal has often been kind of criticized for discussions of, you know, topics that are relevant to like violence and gore, um, or even just for the use of like things like vulgar language. Um, so I was wondering, like, you know, do you ever kind of consider those kind of responses when you write? Yeah, I mean, abnormality was very, um, how would you say, like, more abstract. Um, and we did have some political or conspiracy influences, but we tried to make it more abstract so that someone could read into it what they wanted. But castrator is a bit more in your face. <laughs> so I do, and, and it's pretty clear what we're saying most of the time, and that's on purpose. You know, we want to be an unapologetic, you know, brutal band and we want to say what we want to say, you know, love it or hate it. Um, I think for me, the most interesting bands, you know, say what they want to say um, without over editing themselves. And that's, you know, how I want this band to be. So, of course, like, I think if... <laughs> That said, like, if you're like a Nazi or something, then <laughs> you get the response that you deserve, right? But I think, <laughs> yeah. I think, I think we're coming from a good place. I mean, we're <laughs> speaking, we're speaking from our hearts and our minds, you know, as women in the world. And I think we have a lot to say and interesting things to say that I think, that I hope will be well received, but there's a chance that some people have a problem with it and that's just the way it is, you know, anyone with an interesting message will have people that like it and people that don't, you know, so you can't really obsess about that. You can't be afraid how someone's going to take it. You're going to find the people that it resonates with. You're going to find fans for whatever you're doing. If you speak from the heart and with passion. So that's how, that's how I try to see it. Um, yeah. Is that clear? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And metal's often thought of like, especially from an outsider perspective, right, as some as a kind of uh, a genre that revels in sort of being offensive um, and using offensive terminology, et cetera. And like castrator is definitely, uh, you know, there's there's some provocativeness to your lyrics and I guess even the name in a way. Uh, but do you ever feel like is there a desire to offend or shock when you write or? I think. Um... We're kind of, um, we're taking a typical misogynic, misogynistic lyrics mm -hmm. and in some songs flipping it on its head, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, it is offensive to some people, especially traditional death metal heads that are expecting the same types of messages. Um, some people some guys are threatened by it and there are some men that really dislike feminism or anything resembling feminism or social justice um so there there are some people that don't like our lyrics so far um but like i said it's not for them and it's okay <laughs> um yeah i had a I had another thing i was trying to say <laughs> Try to like remember my point, but um, refresh me what 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 we were what you were just asking. Okay. I uh, just like, you know, with um, like Castrator's music, definitely, you know, being confrontational. I was curious if if uh, a desire to offend people was part of the intent or if that's something that just kind of happens in writing death metal. Like, like is 
I guess the question of like, is right, you feel like offensiveness it. is intentional or offensiveness is just kind of a consequence of exploring things in a metal way? Uh, yeah, I, th I think it's just, uh, we're not trying to offend, but we're being unapologetic in our yeah. perspectives and our, in what we're saying. We want to be stand up and say things with a strong voice mm -hmm. and we're not going to be afraid about offending people. I know some people will be offended by what we say, but we're not being shocking just for the sake of being shocking. Mm. Um, we have a strong message. We believe in what we're saying. Um, so there's a difference. Some bands are just trying to be shocking, you know, sh mm -hmm. shock for the sake of shock is a different thing. And um, that's not what we're coming from. Like there are bands like just singing about like porno grind, uh, like just thinking <laughs> about like uh, some very sexual things and like, uh, or, you know, some types of misogynistic death metal is just purely about shocking people, like uh, about rape and murder and, and writing about serial killers. Like that's, it's different. Yeah. Um, so I think I understand why some bands want to be shocking just to draw attention to themselves and it and as, there's also the side of anti-religion in the music um some people doing it just to be shocking and some people really are fighting in their country for free speech when their country is really ruled by a religious power i mean like behemoth for instance mm. their goal is like having some kind of court case right now <laughs> about <Yeah. laughs> in, in Poland for having extreme lyrics so in some cases there are repercussions to having uh, anti-religious subjects in your songs and I think music in that way is an interesting tool of, of free speech and making some kind of political change um, but it's different than when a band's just doing it and there's no like repercussions. I guess there's, it's like a stronger message when you're actually standing up against something, you know, mm. or like, I think black metal in the nineties um, being anti-Christian and having pagan uh, themes in their songs is really interesting. I don't, necessarily condone the church burning but I think they really stood by what they said which I respect I respect like standing for what you believe in you know mm. but um yeah so I, I I respect bands that doing something with a purpose rather than just you know saying something shocking just for the sake of something shocking do you think exploring just like things that are, there are interviews that have happened with bands, especially some of the early ones that said like they want to kind of recreate the feel of a horror movie or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but do you think that like that kind of music or lyrics that are just trying to be horrific uh, because the people like it for whatever reason can itself be, you know, a meaningful statement if if that's something like the, the exploration of the obscene itself can be. Yeah, it can um, be meaningful. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it can be art. Yeah. Like, mm. um, Nidoris, I guess, is an example more. I mean, mm -hmm. what we're exploring just like a rotting, decay, death is a kind of the theme of the band. Um, and in movies, yeah, like the whole horror genre, I don't think they're condoning murder. And, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think I think it's a it's a form of art. Mm. Um, so musically can be I think if you're doing it, you should try to do it in an interesting way, mm. you know, poet more poetic way explore new territory because there's such a large amount of death metal bands with those kinds of horror themes mm. so it's hard to stand out these days hard to do something new if you're doing something along those lines so do you think it had more kind of impact and like uh, social meaning when it first started compared to now sort of yeah i mean it was new territory in the 90s band like with the band death mm -hmm. the first like mm. arguably the first death metal band and um but chuck Schulner had different uh subjects in his songs but some were about like drink from the goblet of gore and like, <laughs> <laughs> like uh you know zombies and things and then he has a song called the philosopher you know mm. 
you can imagine what that's about. Yeah, so like uh, Chuck Schulner explored a lot of different lyric themes. Um, so in that way, yeah, he was a unique person and um, he already did cover like death and gore and zombies. And then there's been so many bands since then and Cannibal Corpse also explored, you know, zombies and death and gore and <laughs> and rape and things like that yeah but um yeah i think it's been fully explored those areas mm. but the, the, i guess there's always a chance someone can find a new angle to it or something but yeah i think it's art like you know music is art it's just like is your art good or not <laughs> is your art <laughs> unique or not <laughs> i i think uh you know, so, sometimes society condemns metal heads and metal musicians as, you know, you know, f following the devil or something or like, you know, being not music or something. And I think, you know, that's wrong. And mm. people, people often judge us. And people are often overly judgmental of, of metal music without giving it a chance. Hmm. And is that like, I suppose, like, have you noticed that happening um, in metal, like throughout um, the world? Or is that, I suppose, um, an experience that's more particular to uh, your experiences in the US? Uh, I think every country will have its own reaction to metal. But metal is something that connects us all in different countries. I think it's how we're talking now. Mm. Um, and in more conservative countries, more religious countries, they usually have a harsher reaction to metal music. Um, but in growing up in the US and having my first bands in the US, it wasn't really, uh, it wasn't hard. It wasn't, I didn't feel like I was judged too harshly. A lot of times it's just like, why bother? Because <laughs> it's so <laughs> underground. Like, <laughs> you know, a lot of people like just think it's stupid or something. But yeah, like it's just very underground kind of music. Now that you lived abroad for a bit, have you noticed any differences between, say, how European bands and American bands approach lyric writing, or perhaps how uh, European bands and American bands um, approach like their stage shows? Is there is there a, a cultural difference to how this is engaged with? Yeah, I have noticed some differences. Um, lyrically, like, I don't think there's a whole lot of difference because like most bands are writing in English to reach an international audience. It's just some, you can tell sometimes when a band isn't that good with English, like, and like I said, I try not to judge too harshly because like cool for them that they know multiple languages, you know, and uh, it would be really hard for me to write a song in Czech, for instance. <laughs> So um, yeah, like lyrically, I think it's like, it's not that different because they're going for the same kind of goals of writing songs in English. Um, but stage show wise, yeah, there are differences in crowd, crowds at metal, metal shows behave differently, I've noticed. Um, and in the US, re there's regional differences to having toured, um, nationally and internationally I have noticed differences in the types of crowds and the aggression it can really vary hmm. um, in Massachusetts we had you know a lot of metal and hardcore in our history so there would be a lot of mixed crowds and a lot of violence at the shows really intense moshing and then I would go to somewhere else like in the Midwest and it wasn't so violent or like there was less hardcore influence. Um, hmm. And I noticed here in Prague, the crowds are really gentle <laughs> compared, to, <laughs> compared to where I grew up. I mean, it was totally normal to, you know, get punched or kicked in the face, you know, in, in Boston, uh, you'd see bloody noses and stuff at shows and here there's like almost no contact in the in the mosh pit somehow <laughs> they're just like really just like <laughs> dance, dancing around in a circle but but not hitting each other mostly mostly that's what i've observed like everyone's really aware of where their limbs are going while they're doing their mosh pit dancing um mm. pretty respectful crowds yeah. but they yeah it's it's just different you know different uh different show cultures 
And you can see that in the US, there's you know different places and different types of crowds. Yeah. And like, do you shift your uh, performance at all? Like when you play for different crowds, like in different countries or like, you know, for instance, like in terms of your like crowd banter, do you change the way you interact with the audience? Like depending on where you're playing? I might, I might, especially if the crowd isn't really moving. And I have observed in some countries, it's really their way is like just to stand totally straight and still and not move at all. <laughs> and I'd be like, oh, like tough crowd. Uh, like, I wonder if they, they didn't like it or something. At the end of the show, they're like, oh, awesome show. Really loved it. I was like, really? Because like nobody was moving at all. <laughs> like, like, I think Switzerland is like that. And I was like, really? Like, you, <laughs> you guys liked it, but like nobody was moving. And they're like, yeah, that's just like how we are. Like, okay. Yeah. So I might, you know, get more, try to give more energy, you know, if, if the show, I always give energy. I always try to make the show enjoyable, but I might try hard to more to move the crowd around if they're standing very still or something or like, yeah, I try to connect with the crowd, you know, and if, if I feel like I'm not connecting with them, I might try something different. It's hard to say specifically, but mm. Yeah, I, I usually am very interactive with the crowd. I, I might even jump into the mosh pit, you know. I've done that That's a cool. lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's just an interesting question because it's one that we've, like, come up against, like, a few times, um, like, you know, with people, like, from Australia, for instance, saying that, um, you know, when they perform overseas, they've noticed that uh, things like, you know, joking with the crowd don't necessarily, like, go over as well as they would here. Um, so like, you know, in the scene, scene here, based on what musicians have told us before, uh, there seems to be a certain expectation that vocalists will kind of like have a bit of banter with the crowd and joke and that kind of thing. But that doesn't, according to their experiences, at least, doesn't seem consistent uh, overseas. Is that the same for yeah, you? Yeah, I've noticed that, like, but I think maybe they're interpreting it wrong. And it's not that necessarily the humor. Maybe they just didn't understand your English. Like I have, like I, when I'm speaking in a non-English, uh, when I'm, performing in a non-English speaking country, you know, I try to use simpler words and like try to be more understandable than I would in an American show um, because I know that English is not their first language and they might not get a joke, you know, mm. and a certain kind of joke. Um, and I even try to throw in some words in their language just, you know, to mm. show <laughs> that, I, that I care, you know, that, that I'm happy to be in their country, you know. And like we played in Colombia one time and, and my Spanish is okay. <laughs> and so I was like, I was speaking, you know, some Spanish to them, you know. So like I try when I can to speak the native language a little bit to connect with the crowd. So yeah, we wanted to like talk a little bit more about your lyrics uh, in more detail. And I suppose going off what we were talking about before regarding kind of the overarching themes of both uh, No Victim and your kind of upcoming release. Um, of course, you know, as we discussed, there seem to be, you know, very kind of common elements of death metal, including kind of images of, you know, violence and death. Uh, but of course, as you were saying, a lot of this uh, violence is kind of described as perpetrated by women against men, um, which is obviously decidedly less common in death metal. <laughs> um, so... I was wondering, given death metal obviously has a history of describing, um, you know, rape and torture women in their lyrics, if not, you know, as you were saying, outright engaging in misogyny in the you musician's know, own lives, um, what's the significance of using kind of death metal as a vehicle to kind of flip this script? I just think it's a great tool of expression, especially for those darker elements and darker emotions. Um, it's a great vehicle for exploring anger and frustrations um and often as women we're encouraged not to show anger um so it's it's a great place to show it and i feel like it's productive it's a it's a way of um coping with those feelings and helping other people uh, with their anger or frustrations. It's a way of getting it out in an artistic form. Um, and also maybe getting people to talk about subjects that are hard to discuss or think about things in a different way that maybe they didn't think about. Raising awareness towards 
issues that aren't talked about enough. Is, is the violent themes part of the communication of this message? Like, do you think that the use of these kind of uh, violent themes that are familiar to death metal audiences make the message more palatable, or do you think they make them more confronting to the male dominated scene, or is this even a consideration? I think we're not necessarily promoting violence. Hmm. We live in a violent world. We're facing the violence, we're facing the darkness, we're facing uh, trauma, trauma that we, we've all been exposed to or heard about that often gets swept under the rug or people have to bury deep inside themselves, which I think is more toxic, more damaging to not discuss trauma or, or anger, to bury it is worse. So we're exposing, we're releasing it to the surface and letting mm. it go. And I think that's healthy and is healthy for a lot of metalheads. A lot of, you know, friends I know or fans, they're some of the most calm, happy, well-adjusted people because they have metal. And I think normies, <laughs> normal <laughs> people don't have that um, and can be more messed up because they aren't, don't ever allow themselves to vent their frustrations or anger and maybe some sometimes they crack they explode maybe at their loved ones or something because they don't have a way to let out their anger or frustrations or past traumas um of course there's many ways to release it you know this is just one way one tool of course there's therapy and <laughs> uh, <laughs> writing meditation there's you know this is our meditation this is this is <laughs> our our art but there are many other ways, yeah. So do you think the violent imagery is kind of, a, of an important component of that cathartic experience? Because I suppose yeah, something that I, I thought of, like when I've read the lyrics is like, I wonder if this would, I suppose, have such a profound effect if the violent images weren't in there. So like, I want you to explain to me like what, which violent images, because not every song is violent. Um, Sometimes it's just like a dark um, subject or a dark feeling or sad, you know, it's not always violent and yeah. we're not always, we're not always violent yeah. on stage. For instance, there's not always, it's just, uh, it's a part of it. Right. But it's not only yeah. violent. I suppose I was thinking sure. of like, um, for think instance, that. like, um, you know, the emasculator or um, mm -hmm. no victim itself, right? Um, uh -huh. yeah. As like having like really violent images, but it's also like really violent images that involve like female empowerment. So I suppose, mm -hmm. yeah, I was wondering like if there's a kind of relationship between those kind of two themes. Yeah, but uh, sometimes it's a reaction to violence done to yeah. you. Yeah, like standing up to someone who's trying to rape you or assault you. So it's a self-defense. Yeah. You're not the person that per perpetrated the original violence. So yeah. it's about, you know, taking a stand and defending yourself. Um, and the emasculator is, you know, having a revenge on rapists who originally did a trauma to you. So we're not promoting senseless violence or, you know, going hmm. attacking someone on the street. It's about, it's in some cases, revenge. So yeah, I think it's a part of it, but I think it's a justified part of it or understandable yeah. part of it. And it's like the aggression of the music, it suits it. Yeah, this, these kinds of themes, but it doesn't have to be uh, violent themes in death metal. like like we talked about you know you could be singing about outer space or something but, yeah. but it helps to have this kinds of at least dark and and aggressive lyrics it it does suit the music did i answer the question yeah, no, well? totally. yeah. it's just like i think like yeah, my experience like as a listener was just that like i think i personally like felt that it was cathartic and I think that I personally did connect to like some of the like violent imagery Good. because I did feel like it was a strong expression of that you know very yeah, familiar that... feeling for us you know? yeah I, I want the listener to feel empowered I want mm. the listener to feel empowered whereas maybe uh especially our female listeners maybe feel like they're disempowered often so I want yeah. them to feel like you know, like that they can reclaim their power and to feel 
feel strength through the music. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, yeah, I'm especially interested in this idea of like the justified violence as well, because that seems to also kind of really flip, um, you know, the typical death metal violence script on its head as well, right? Because obviously that's, yeah. you know, the really classic death metal, like violent rape scenes and stuff, like obviously are unjustified <laughs> violence. So, you know, not only is it just a matter of like, you know, the women perpetrating the violence against the men, it's also like in, as you're saying, in response to trauma mm -hmm. and oppression. Yeah, that's that's the goal, and I think it's unique in, in our band. Yeah, I think there's there's a place for it in in the world, and uh, I think it's critiquing, it's reflecting on the history of death metal in a way too, and critiquing it through mm. through the through something new. I'm just kind of curious. There's um. There's a lot of research on metal that has talked about, uh, especially from sc scholars in kind of a feminist tradition, about the, at least, you know, uh, the face contradiction of, of women who care about women's issues, you know, wearing cannibal corpse shirts. Uh, I, I have a tag in my um, research database on articles that mention the song Fucked with a Knife, uh, mm -hmm. because I, there's like eight at least that I've read so far that like specifically talk about that song about going to a show and seeing a woman wearing a shirt that has that written on the back of it or the front of it. Um, and there's been arguments made that even though this lyric is, these lyrics are obviously, you know, uh, expressing violence towards women that through the metal scene, they're looking for this kind of catharsis that you mentioned. Do you think mm -hmm. that the opposite is possible too? Like, do you think that men can find uh, catharsis or expression through these lyrics that express uh, violence against uh I, well, hopefully, men that, uh, given you know what you just said, the male speaker, the listeners don't identify with, but just violence against men in general, uh, you know, discussions of castration, uh, mutilation of the male body, instead of just uh, the opposite that has been so long traditional within the extreme metal scene. Yeah, I think uh, the listener can find catharsis whether they're male or female. They, I think, through the release of the anger, the frustrations, the general feeling of the music. We actually, Castrator has a lot of male fans as well as females. Um, so yeah, and with typical death metal too, I think the anger alone uh, portrayed in the music is enough for the listener to feel a catharsis and like uh, feel less alone in their anger and their frustrations. Yeah, mm -hmm. with, without even going deeper than the music itself, I think just going to a death metal show and, you know, interacting with the crowd, moshing, you know, enjoying the show is a great release for myself and I see for, for a lot of people. Mm. Um, and so we were saying before that, um, you know, the um, purpose of a lot of the songs is to kind of uh, like tap into the emotions and experiences of so people like women mm -hmm. and femmes. Um, and, um, I was just wondering, um, you know, because I noticed that a lot of the songs were also specifically written from a woman's perspective. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering, is this like, you know, an important choice for you that, you know, when you are describing, you know, for instance, um, you know, like in Honor Killing or, you know, No Victim, you know, the potential for violence against women, is it, you know, important for you to describe this from a woman's perspective? I think because there are so few uh, female musicians, especially a few all-female bands. Um, I think it's important um, to give a voice to women, especially um, on women's rights issues or, or you know, specific types of themes. I think it hasn't really been, some, some have not been really explored before. So I do think uh, it's important um, and just in general that more women's voices should be heard, but especially in a, in a male dominated uh, genre, I think it's great and it's great to see more and more women being involved in adding their own unique perspectives to, to music. Yeah. <laughs> is that, is there part of that I missed? So catch me no, if no, I'm like um, not fully answering your questions. <laughs> I guess I was just kind of wondering, like, you know, in attempting to uh, like write from like a decidedly, uh, you know, female perspective, um, did this influence your language choices in any way when you were actually writing the lyrics? I think it just comes out naturally. 
I mean, like we are women, we're writing from our perspective. It's going to just happen. That is going to be mm. different, different in some ways. It's, we're not, we don't really have to try too hard. Um, <laughs> just, just, you know, showing our point of view, what pisses us off, what appalls us, what shocks us, what, what we want to speak up about is, you know, comes from within. Mm. Given that a lot and, of this, you're saying, oh, sorry. No, no, go oh. ahead. Oh, just like you're saying comes from within. We noticed that a lot of your songs use like the second person perspective. Is so there a reason that you avoid saying like I? I haven't really thought about that, but in a lot of cases with Castrator, I am thinking about another person, like a woman's struggles, something that she went through, and I'm empathizing with her, with her story. And I think it's easier for me to do that with the second person than the first person, especially if it's like a real person that I'm reading about her story, like then I can just visualize her life. But I think it just was a natural choice. There's not a reason I didn't put myself directly in her shoes to say I, me. Mm -hmm. But I think it's kind of, it kind of makes it like more of a story, more of a narrative than just a personal story. But there will be personal stories to come <laughs> <laughs> okay cool i'll have to ask you about that when the release um okay. yeah, comes out. <laughs> yeah. um, i suppose other death metal vocalists that we've um talked to have discussed a kind of desire to avoid first person reference um just to allow mm. the listener to kind of like insert themselves into the story like you were saying is that like a consideration for you too yeah i think it kind of it's just like reading a, a, a story, like a fiction book or something, like setting an atmosphere, uh, setting up the characters, the story, what happens, mm. um, then like a personal diary or something. I guess it kind yeah. of, it's a style choice, I guess. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I guess like something that we've heard like from musicians is like, if they say, um, if they use I in their lyrics, then they mm. said it, it, it communicates a bit more like ownership over the story. And yeah. maybe people can feel less like, you know, they can see themselves in the yeah, story. Yeah, that's right. Know, yeah. And it's more like, if you're, gonna, if you're going to make the decision to say I, then you're kind of taking this position of, this is my personal story. Yeah. And I want you to listen to me and what I have to say. Right. Versus if you say he, she, then yeah, it's a bit more open to interpretation I think mm. um yeah the, I think the only song that actually um doesn't involve like a he or she but rather shifts to the um second person you is um you know on your new release when you uh, focus on uh the song about uh, toxic masculinity mm -hmm. um so I was wondering um is the shift to the second person perspective there like intentional for this song I think it's a little bit uh, confrontational on mm -hmm. purpose. I think so. Yeah. Um, without giving too much away. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is directed at a certain type of man. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. and, me and meant to be confrontational. Yeah. So I think mm -hmm. it was a subconscious <laughs> choice, but a purposeful. <laughs> Yeah, I just wondered if you know it's kind of departing from like that more like story like mm -hmm. uh, like mm -hmm. tone of some of the other songs, and then becoming a little bit more like as you're saying direct. Yeah, I suppose in yeah, its I approach. Think, yeah, mm -hmm. I think I think so. Yeah. We also um and looking at your lyrics, kind of overall, we noted that uh they're not super gory. There's some you know we there's some violence that we talked about, and so definitely some confrontational mm -hmm. imagery, but. Uh, in general, there's not a whole lot of discussion of gore, with one kind of clear exception being the song Brood, uh, with lyrics like obstetrical hemorrhaging on soiled sheets, tearing of perennia, <laughs> multiple births, followed by placental expulsion, uh, which clearly focuses on the process of giving birth. I guess in general, uh, why do you avoid uh, or do you even think about avoiding kind of graphic discussions of gore when you have these scenes of violence and stabbing, you know, uh, perpetrators of uh, rape, et cetera. And then I guess on the other hand, why did for this song, you decide to go onto these really, um, I guess, brutal, uh, very explicitly described, um, you know, scenes of, of blood and, and guts and uh, perenniums and, and et cetera. <laughs> I guess. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh... I think it's like, it's kind of personal being a woman and thinking about childbirth. Um, it can be very violent and gory and it's all happening within your own body. 
Mm. Uh, I think as a woman, we can really like describe it well without, I think I, I generally avoid uh, very specific gory things like to, to avoid glorifying gore or violence. Um, I think that's often what bands do is they glorify it as like a, a killer murdering someone and describing it in juicy detail as a way to glorify violence. So that's not the angle I take in my lyrics. Um, mm. So if some violence is being done, I try to explore more of the emotion or um, you know what the victim is going through and they wouldn't really be describing in detail the gore <laughs> you know it's like uh, <laughs> more about the shock and the anger and later the more what has been done to them what has been taken away from them not just the simple mm. physical attack you know um, right so what, what I was exploring in brood was you know women's bodies you know and having babies and often women being reduced to being seen as baby makers you know mm. and uh mm. exploring you know in general it was a, a bit of a critique on women that are you know having like 10 children or something you know <laughs> like so many children where they kind of like disappear who they are they're like all of a sudden they're just you know baby makers you know so but it's also you know it was before I ever had a baby <laughs> that I was <laughs> writing about this and just like imagining you know what your body goes through the trauma of childbirth mm. and like how it's you know can be scary for us women mm. you know and it's just like you know a, a natural process <laughs> that in mm. our bodies that can be quite terrifying uh so mm -hmm it was an interesting idea that I wanted to explore in the lyrics <laughs> and uh it was a little bit personal <laughs> too but I, a family a family member of mine has seven children <laughs> so it was like kind of like exploring that uh my feelings about it but yeah I was a bit ju judgy I think a little bit too <laughs> um so you, I, you wouldn't send them the lyrics then <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> you know now that i'm a mother myself you know i might i might think differently about writing i might, might have written it a different way but mm -hmm. now as i look back on it, it it's more just like if if you're a woman and and you don't want this to happen with your body which ha happens a lot it can be quite horrifying to have a baby to go through childbirth it can be really horrifying especially if it's against your will Mm. Um, so I appreciate that song now for that, from that angle. And as I got, I've gotten older, I, I generally try not to pass judgment on other people <laughs> and for their, <laughs> for their life choices. <laughs> so I guess I've matured a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I still think it's a really interesting idea, like to, um, I suppose, use this again kind of like a recognizably death metal formula in describing like the gruesome detail um mm -hmm. of you know a relatively I suppose mundane in some ways like biological process um but removing it from you know the typical context that we would more commonly see where you know there'd be more violence I suppose involved. yeah yeah violence done to a victim but yeah. it, can, it can be violent something just happening within your own body like yeah. a, a natural thing like that can be violent and I've heard so many women had such awful experiences with childbirth like traumatic experiences that have left them permanently damaged and yeah it's it's something that has not been explored in the death metal context yeah definitely. probably <laughs> because probably because men aren't having the babies <laughs> themselves no. so they haven't they haven't thought about it from that way so i guess that's what's exciting about you know being a woman writing death metal is like there's new areas to explore like this one mm. Um, so talking about Brood, I actually noticed that um, in that song and in the masculine as well, there's quite a lot of uh, medical terminology, uh, including, like we were saying before, oreectomy, uh, obstetrical uh, hemorrhaging and frenium <laughs> that uh, Wes mentioned before. Uh, some of these I had to honestly look up. I wasn't familiar with them. So like, what's the purpose of including this terminology? Um, to really root you in the real realism 
Mm -hmm. uh, they are real words associated with childbirth. Um, and I think in a lot of ways, real life can be more horrifying and more gruesome than anything imagined. So to root it in, in realism and to force the listener, the reader to uh, really imagine the full scene, the scenario, rather than, yeah, rather than it being just some fantasy, it's rooted in reality. Do you like where do you find these words though? Like uh, oreectomy <laughs> is, is, for instance, not a word that I, I've stumbled across <laughs> until your lyrics. Um, how, you know, do you look at do you go out of your way to find these kind of terms? Yeah. So um, I are you? Uh, yeah, like I said, like for the song, I was like, okay, I'm gonna write about this, and then I just I on this in this case, I was really uh researching childbirth and the process and like really, you know, reading about it with the real medical terminology and then like, mm. okay, like this is pretty gruesome or sounds gruesome. I'm going to like write this <laughs> word, or this, this phrase down and include it in the lyrics. So yeah, th that was definitely purposeful. Um, and I did do some research because at that point I had never had a baby. I wasn't really sure what the perineum was. Now I'm well aware. <laughs> about it <laughs> I can tell you more than you'll want to know about the perineum <laughs> um but uh yeah so I was exploring also because like when I was younger I was like terrified of pregnancy and childbirth so it just kind of fed into my fear I guess to read about it in gruesome detail mm. um so I, I I guess I'm glad to hear sure. that it was successful <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> like, do you think that medical terminology rather than, you know, like the more everyday equivalent makes it scarier? Yeah, and I guess scary, but also maybe more mysterious or more, mm. I think it's good if maybe there's one or two words you don't know and it will make you go look it up. <laughs> I, think, I like I like that. If, if, if I did that, then I'm happy. And personally myself, if I am reading some death metal lyrics and there's a word that sounds cool and I don't know it, I I'm excited to go look it up. So mm. I don't mind to do that in my lyrics and I'm happy to do that, you know, use a word that's more obscure. Um, I think it just makes for more interesting lyrics, but it can be overdone. You know, if a band is mm. doing it too much, it can come off as trying too hard or something, you know? Mm. So I think to be done tastefully and as long as the, the lyrics go together and sound good together, then it's working, successful. I mean, it's interesting to me though, is despite all this kind of brutal imagery and, and you know, uh, again, scenes that, I guess the average person used the term normies uh, earlier would find, <laughs> you know, unpleasant. Uh, there's no real vulgarity or swearing in your lyrics. I think the, the closest we found was the word dick, but even then, um, like you say, <laughs> uh, genital parts, penile amputation, uh, did you consciously avoid swearing in your lyrics? And if so, uh, why? And I guess also, I, while on this, is there kind of um, a gap between the sort of brutality and potential offensiveness of the lyrics and the themes themselves versus this lack of, you know, traditional words that are themselves considered offensive? Okay, that's like a two-part question. Let me <laughs> let me go with the first yeah, part and then yeah. and then remind me of the second start, part yeah, so I don't forget. The part, so the first the just because yeah. I I'm, I'm forgetting by the end of the first half. So um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I intentionally don't use swearing in my lyrics. I maybe I've done it once or twice, but I can't recall. It, and it was probably a bandmate had written a lyrics and that's why it was in there like I usually don't put swear words just because I think it's too easy uh boring juvenile I I I usually don't write with swearing um I think it's more impactful not to and still mm -hmm. get across the feeling when you're swearing it's just kind of like there you said it oh are you offended or not offended I don't know it's just like it's there's a lack of conversation after that I think it's just it, it's just mm -hmm. like a, a period the end and there's so much more interesting ways to say something than to use a swear word it's it's a style mm -hmm. choice of course mm. not to judge other bands that do um 
Uh, so yeah, so in, in Castrated, uh, the drummer also writes lyrics. I think I sent you some of those um, mm, from, the, yeah. from the No Victim EP. So when I'm writing with a bandmate, they might have a different style than me and that's okay. And I've also performed songs with some lyrics written by a bandmate and sometimes there's a square. <laughs> but when I'm writing, I, I purposefully don't include it. Do you find yourself using swear words in other contexts, like just in your daily life or like during banter between songs? Oh yeah, yeah, like or or not not usually on, on the stage, no, but in my personal life, yeah, sure, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> but like you know, on the stage, I mean, maybe I I don't know. It's yeah, I think it's fun to say fuck, like you know, it's, just, <laughs> it's a fun word. Uh, yeah, and like all the different uh, conjugations of fuck, it's like too too much fun not to in your <laughs> in your daily life. <laughs> so this is avoiding. This is literally just avoiding in the lyrics, not avoiding yeah. altogether, like in your life. Mm. So like, if you think about it as a painting, this is the perfect mm -hmm. example. Like as a visual artist, I can make these comparisons. So like in a painting, like oil painting or acrylic painting. If you're a good artist, you would never use the color black. And an amateur artist would just like put black all over it. And you can see that right away. If you've ever been painting for any amount of time, you know that black is just going to ruin the painting. And it's far more interesting to use a really dark shade of blue or green and to see some subtle little color in there. It's far more interesting to look at. And when you see a painting with big black outlines in like one color, it's just like, okay, next, you know, it just loses your interest right away. So mm -hmm. I think that's like mm. what swearing does. It's just this big black outline with no subtleties. And uh, as a piece of art, it's just simple and it can be boring, I think. I, I think I actually answered by se the second part of my question. So that's fine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I did. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, sorry. I, great. I, I, I realize, uh, yeah, that was a bit, maybe a bit too much to try to jam into one question, but I think your answer <laughs> hit both points that I was looking uh, curious okay. about. So yeah, thank you. Great. <laughs> um, yeah, so I did want to talk a little bit about your upcoming release, but obviously only in very general terms. Um, and one of the questions I had was just that, you know, although I can kind of see some similarities in the lyrical content of No Victim and this new release, it seems like in uh, No Victim, you're talking a lot more about instances or stories that are indicative of kind of broader issues of, um, you know, oppression and violence against women. Whereas it seems like in the newest release, you seem to be dealing with kind of systemic issues a bit more directly. Um, you know, for instance, you have a song about, um, you know, grooming victims for abuse that specifically addresses privilege of, um, you know, white, the white, the male and the wealthy. Um, mm -hmm. What prompted this like shift in focus? Was it a conscious choice? Uh, it's just to explore new territory mainly and to get more specific. Uh, it made it easier to find new ideas. Um, and in our demo, yeah, there was a couple like more general songs already done. So I didn't want to repeat territory that we already covered. Um, mm -hmm. Revenge on a rapist. Okay, done. Now what? <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, so I tried to explore new territory, not to repeat myself. Um, and you know, on the on the No Victim EP, we had a song "Honor Killing," and mm. that was very that was specific. You know about. Yeah. A, a certain epidemic of hatred and violence against women in mm -hmm. certain countries, including uh, my father's country, India. So yeah, it was, that was an example of, you know, a detailed topic. And so, yeah, in this, this upcoming album, we, we have more specific scenarios that we're exploring. A lot of the lyrics you have um, seem to kind of directly address these political and social topics. And uh, that's the thing that's kind of interesting is because we've seen a lot of metal uh, in general, and this is kind of, of course, just our impression. There obviously are bands that are explicitly political, you know, uh, mm -hmm. Napalm Death, uh, Capital Decapitation, they don't kind of hesitate at this at all. Mm -hmm. But broadly speaking, you know, we mentioned Origin, exploring space and stuff, uh, mm -hmm. ca you know, Cannibal Corpse, they're talking about murdering people. Mm -hmm. The scene itself seems to have a... Uh, tendency not to explicitly state like political opinions and there's even been some research arguing that uh people in the scene have kind of opposed it like the, the idea that the message should be hidden is this um a feeling you've ever gotten in the scene or have you heard like opinions that 
lyrics could should hide their message in metal or uh is it something you don't really think is there like have you tried to resist this in your own lyrics or is it something you don't even care about i guess it depends on what you mean by political but i did see some bands taking a stand against trump for instance mm. in the last election like exhumed was taking a stand against donald trump and it did alienate some fans you know it so politics can be very divisive, um, especially in the landscape in America. I won't talk about like political candidates in my lyrics, but I will definitely talk no, I... about about certain things. So like about politics, like yeah. I guess it can mean a lot of different things, right? Um, but I do take. I a guess stand. I like I didn't. I definitely didn't mean like why don't you sing about specific politicians, but more like uh, um, the I, there has been. At least, again, in, in research, which we've kind of noted may be disconnected from the experiences of real musicians, there's been arguments a lot of metal musicians like won't talk about kind of real world topics, I guess. Maybe that's a better mm -hmm. way of phrasing it rather than okay. political topics, okay. like uh, trying to kind of hide everything in discussions of zombies. Um, mm -hmm. Or is, is that like, have uh, you encountered that kind of belief? So like, and you had mentioned Naples, Napalm Death and they do speak very specifically mm -hmm. about real world issues. And I respect that. And that's definitely what I strive for with Castrator is, you know, to talk about real wo world issues and to take a stand about injustices. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't try to hide that. Um, and I think, I think that it's a choice. Some bands prefer not to take a stand, prefer to be more generic and appeal to more people. Mm. Um, and if you are going to be unafraid of being political or speaking about real world issues, you have to be ready that there can be a backlash and you, you know, only you know, some, some groups of people won't listen to your music because of it, but then you are gonna appeal that much more to people that really, uh, that the message resonates with. Mm. So yeah, like if you're, your lyrics are anti-Christian, for instance, then Christian metalheads aren't going to listen to your music. <laughs> but, but then the fan that Probably really not. is pissed off about Christianity and what it's done to their country or their family, then that fan might be excited to find your music. So it's all about, you know, making the music about what you want it to be about and finding the right listener base for it. Um, and if you are going to have... A strong message you have to be ready that you know it might you know you might have a more specific audience than you would mm. have if you, if you sang mm. a more generic way if you had a more generic subject matter but i think it can be a good thing and a bad thing for your band you know it's like you can it can help you to stand out if you have a strong message or a unique representation of your a unique uh, presentation of your band it can it can be a good thing and it could also hurt your band if you're an an SBM band like uh, <laughs> mm. with the question, questionable uh, Nazi uh, ideologies <laughs> in your lyrics or something it might hurt your band you might have Antifa at your shows or something you know so you have to be ready to personally stand behind your music if you have a strong message and uh, talking to Barney from Napalm Death, you know, he's had mm -hmm. people trying to fight him at shows because of the strong message in their music. And he had to like punch someone that was trying to punch him like in the front row of his show one time. So like, <laughs> <laughs> it can get violent, you know, it can, uh, it can really get heated if, if you're really taking a strong stand with your music and your message. Um, I think it's probably calmed down, but like in the early days of, uh, in the earlier days of Napalm Death, I think it was quite divisive mm. from, mm. from the stories they told us when we were touring with them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I suppose one of the things that um, we have also heard like in relation to this topic is just that even um, metal musicians who do like to kind of treat, um, you know, the real world issues, say they feel like they can't necessarily treat them directly, like they, you know, ha they have to like disguise it in like some kind of metaphor or something like that um mm -hmm. i mean yeah one of the people that we've um, spoken to recently said that um you know that they when they actually tried to write um a, so a song that did directly address um like you know a real world issue it was actually quite difficult for them to kind of translate this real world mm -hmm. issue into like you know 
a metal song. Um, is that has that been your experience at all? I guess to find sometimes if a lyric is uh, if a song subject is very personal or if I have a really strong feeling about it, sometimes it takes a little while to get in the the headspace of creating of writing uh, in an artistic way. Yeah, you have to kind of separate yourself a little bit to to write the lyrics in an artistic way. You can't just write, fuck this, fuck that. <laughs> you know, yeah, like... well, one of these guys was telling us that like, you know, he felt like when he was first writing those kind of lyrics that it was like he was writing a lecture and he's like, this isn't working yeah. with like a song it format. Come, it can come off preachy. And I think uh, that's something I had to get through when I was first in bands. Mm -hmm. When you're first writing lyrics, um, it's something an inexperienced artist might, not know like you know that the difference and if if you come off overly preachy it's hard mm. for someone to give your song a chance to really listen to what the message is or they might misread what the song is about so to give your song idea and the music the best chance at six you know giving the message that you want to give with your with your music um, it takes some expertise and uh, you kind of have to try to see from an outside perspective like a little bit like in it if I if I was somebody else looking at this song am I going to understand am I going to get the message that mm -hmm. that the person is trying to give with it um, would I understand what this is about without somebody saying it directly mm. um, or if, if not, is that okay? Is that what, do you want it to be vague and mm -hmm. able, open to interpretation or not? So just to write it in the way that, that it will be received in the, in the way you intended, which could be many different things, right? So writing about personal experiences, sometimes it's better to zoom out and uh, write it a little less personal and so that the message can be understood better yeah mm. so speaking of um you know the real world um i of course noticed that most of your songs are very grounded in the real world but um we noticed that like you know some of your songs do kind of um you know evoke spirituality to you know some degree or another um you know particularly of course i'm thinking of one of the songs of the uh, you know upcoming release mm -hmm. um that you know mentions uh you know the goddess shakti um what motivated you uh, to you know ex include um you know these references to spirituality in otherwise um, you know quite grounded in the real world songs yeah um well shakti is the female energy um the primal energy the first energy of the universe and the goddesses of hinduism they inhibit this shakti energy so my father he's hindu and um, half indian and my my mother is american of english descent and she's christian so I grew up with uh, these different influences and different perspectives. And I don't call myself one religion, but I, I align myself more with the Hinduism and the spirituality. Um, and I think I find strength in the goddesses and in, the, in understanding the, fe the female energy and reading about the mythology of, of it, it. It gives me some kind of feeling of peace and strength. And so I try to... I've been trying to put that into my lyrics um, and, sh and share those ideas um, without getting more specific. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, totally yeah, fine, yeah. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's, that's where I'm coming from. And it's not just an outsider perspective. It's like deep mm. within me and my family. So mm. it, is, it is like personal, personal too. Mm. And I feel like one foot in both worlds being of, of mixed origin, of, of mixed race. Um, it's, it's uh, in my music, I'm putting, you know, parts of myself and uh, my upbringing, my, my heritage, it's connecting to those things too and sharing, sharing those ideas. Mm. Cause even, um, you know, if we, um, you know, avoid talking about Shakti yeah. and the Shakti song yeah. too directly, um, I mean, we can <laughs> see that there are, you know, some other references to spir spirituality in other songs. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, for instance, you know, you, you see the phrase like spirits and souls of victims coming up several times across, you know, songs, mm -hmm. even after, you know, no, no victim. Um, so what's the significance of even including like this level of spirituality in the songs? Yeah. So like, I believe in karma and I believe in reincarnation 
and I believe in energy. Like we all give out energy into the world and we receive energy back. And I think what goes around comes around. Like if you're putting out a bad energy into the world, violence is going to come back towards you. If, if you put bad energy out, it, bad energy will come back. But if you put out good energy, then good energy will come back. So I think I allude to that in some songs um, that even if a perpetrator gets away with doing very bad things, I think it comes back around to them somehow. So I think it's those ideas that I've put into the songs even subconsciously. <laughs> I think that just like those lyrics just like came to my head, yeah. Um, but yeah, the idea of reincarnation and stuff, I think it's, it's interesting and it makes far more sense to me than a heaven and a hell and purgatory and yeah, uh, to me, those ancient ideas resonate well with me and, and make far more sense than than somebody burning forever in hell or living mm. in heaven forever. Like, and that's it. Like, yeah. and a God that you shouldn't question. Yeah. So I am a bit anti-Christian and <laughs> and my lyrics. I have been in the past, and it's a reaction to to the whole thing with my mom and born again Christianity and stuff. But I think these days I kind of just don't even write about religion per se, but about the damages that it can inflict mm -hmm. on people, on people. Yeah. Yeah. This uh, topic is, is quite minor compared to some of the stuff we talked about, but just really quickly, we've noticed that uh, throughout some of your songs, there's a little bit of use of rhyme. Uh, such mm -hmm. as with intentions of taking her life, grabs her neck and with a knife, or um, you know, an upcoming you're going to uh, MRA, NRA, lay, pill, will are all kind of you know these sort of rhyming couplets. Uh, is rhyme something you intentionally look to include in your music, and I, if so, uh, why or what role does it, do you think it plays in the lyrical process? Sure, um, the first song actually was written by the drummer, No Victim. Uh, that one was written mm -hmm. by Carolina, um, but yeah, in the other, the second song you mentioned, that that was my lyrics um, from the new album. Um, I do use rhyme sometimes, especially in the chorus of the song, since it's repeated, and I want it to be catchy and memorable. Um, so I will use rhyme and you know keep uh, a kind of repeating of length of syllables in in the lines. Mm -hmm. um, and that's intentional, but I, I'm not tied to rhyming uh, like some writers or lyricists might be. Uh, I'm, I'm not forcing like every other line to rhyme. So it's more like uh, I try to make it that way in the choruses at least, but if, 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 it's, if it is rhyming, I'm okay with that, but it doesn't have to be. Mm. Um, Maybe in the future I will do more, but I, <laughs> for now I, I like the kind of natural, free-flowing kinds of lyrics um, that don't necessarily rhyme. Yeah, I, I guess I see the choruses differently because it's an important part of the song and I want it to stand out and be memorable. Hmm. I guess um, just kind of ultimately to sum things up, uh, what do you feel is the role or purpose of lyrics within the extreme metal genre, especially given the fact that, as you mentioned at the very beginning of this interview, uh, many listeners might not be able to understand, you know, what is being said? <laughs> yeah, it's like, uh, I think it's as important or unimportant as you want it to be as an artist. And as a listener, also as important or unimportant as you want it to be. So if I'm writing an album and it means a lot to me and I spend a lot of time on it, I'm going to realize that there's a whole group of fans out there that are never even going to read the lyrics. And like, that's just the way it is. Mm. But mm. I guess I'm making an effort, you know, to show it for the people that do pay attention that are going to read it and have it mean something to them. So, and it's okay too. I'm not passing judgment because mm. there have been, cases where I also like didn't take the time to read the lyrics so like, I understand <laughs> it you can enjoy and you can enjoy music for its face value music for music's sake um but then a band can really be personal towards you to you and it can inspire you it can 
um, make you think differently. So yeah, I think it can be really quite powerful if you choose to use it for that. Yeah. And if you succeed in creating interesting lyrics, yeah, it can be really great. And it's such a cool feeling uh, when you go play a show and the crowd is singing along with you and they know the lyrics, it, it's mm. really one of the best feelings in the world. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, wow, like, these people really know the song so well that they're singing along <laughs> with me. Like, it's really one of the greatest things in the world, I have to say. So, mm. yeah, it definitely, like, that hard work can certainly pay off. Mm. Does it mean even more the fact that, like, you know, these fans might have had to go to the extra effort of actually, like, looking up your lyrics to learn them? Yeah, I think it's more significant <laughs> with death metal. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. you, know, you know that they took out the lyric sheet or they found it on metal archives or something. Mm. Yeah, it means more, I think, because they can't just listen to it and learn right. the words unless they're very comfortable with death metal. <laughs> it usually <laughs> doesn't work like that. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Well, I mean, I really enjoyed even just the preparation for this interview. I really appreciate uh, that you agreed to do it with us uh, just because I found, um, you know, Castrator's mm. music and particularly the lyrics like really fascinating and really um interesting it's just not something that we've um, really covered so far um and yeah on a personal level I, I personally felt like really inspired by your lyrics and content and the topics that you're covering so um yeah I'm excited That's to hear awesome. there's a new release coming out <laughs> thank you Jess you it's a, really you, awesome do you have a date set up for the new album uh we're still working out a record deal and then then we'll get the release date, but we are in the studio almost finished recording the album and I've completed my vocals. So just waiting awesome. now, <laughs> the hard part. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, this has been such a pleasure. Thank you. And I appreciate uh, your attention to detail and this unique angle for this podcast. I think I haven't, I haven't heard of a similar podcast out there yet. So I wish you the best of luck. Thank Thanks. You. Yeah. And um, oh, where, where can um, listeners kind of keep up with what's, uh, you know, going on with Castrator? So, if, you know, uh, if they want to see uh, when the uh, release is likely to be coming out or when you might be touring, um, where can they find that information? We have a Facebook page and Instagram Castrator band um, and a YouTube channel, which is new so that we don't have a lot of content on there yet, but there will be. So, yeah, awesome. whichever. Yeah. Whichever you prefer, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Awesome. Yeah, I'll post the links in the description of the episode as well. Yep. Awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you for your you. time. It was really, really great. Thanks. Take care thank and okay. stay healthy in, this, in these crazy times. <laughs> yeah, you too. You too. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Okay, bye. 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 Thank you for listening to Lingua Rutalica. We hope you enjoyed it and we hope you stay tuned for our next episode. Before we leave, we just wanted to acknowledge that this podcast is recorded on the unceded lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. We pay respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Mm-hmm.